Flags on the field. It's a miracle. Tennessee has pulled a miracle. Welcome in to the Feels Like 99 podcast, the home of your Tennessee Titans. I'm your host, Drake Kaiser, and I am joined, as always, by my co-host, Caleb Waters. Episode 12, the I can't name a player that wore number 12 except for the 12th fan episode. (laughs) I'm thinking the only one I can think of is Justin Gage, that really old wide receiver from like 2009. Um, Charlie Whitehurst wore number 12. I forgot he. I forgot about him. To be completely honest with you, that's a Ken Wisenhunt guy right there. <laughs> of course it is. Wouldn't you know? Yeah, exactly. Give, give forever. Oh gosh, he he said he literally set us back more in like a year and a quarter season than I think anybody has ever done for an organization. On another note, we haven't recorded in I guess two weeks now, so uh, we would like to send out our apologies for that. Uh, you know, if if anyone even cares, but we. <laughs> We do care, so yeah, we we definitely uh like like you said, two weeks ago was the neutral zone episode, which actually was pretty well received with the you know having Andrew on there and the XFL draft and all that stuff. That was cool and fun, but last week we really just kind of got bogged down and kind of lost track of time and didn't really have a chance, I guess, to kind of get into the studio and record. But this week, we really do. We have something that uh, we think you guys are, are really going to enjoy, and that's that'll be coming up just a little bit later in the show. But for right now, I mean, I guess probably what we're just going to do is just a little bit of general Titans talk. And uh, the biggest thing that's happened since we last recorded is probably the, the Titans uh, getting their entire staff pretty much filled out. Because on our last episode, we kind of talked about potential candidates for just the coaching staff in general. And so since then, the entire staff has come together. So, Caleb, uh, who are you, who are you like really looking at on the staff and being like, wow, that that's a home run hire? Well, I'm definitely going to go with our brand new offensive coordinator, Matt LaFleur. I don't know how much responsibility he had in L.A. with the Rams, but the influence that he had all around him is all I need to know that this offense is going to be explosive next year. But first, before we talk any more about that, we owe our listeners an explanation for our absence. So today is Wednesday, February 14th, a.k.a. Valentine's Day. Also, uh, I guess a holiday for some, not all. But uh, last week we did not record because – Drake started a new job, which he he will be more than happy to tell you guys about. It's pretty cool. And I actually had four tests last week, and I had a ton of computer science work, which is my online class. So I had three tests on uh, last Wednesday and then uh, one on that Tuesday. So we usually record on – I think it's Tuesdays, right? Yeah, Tuesday, Wednesday. So, yeah, that was – my window was closed, and then there was no point in recording any later because, I mean, we're not going to release one on, like, a Saturday when nobody's doing anything. But, um, yeah, that's our reasoning. But, yes, Matt LaFleur is my new favorite coach for the Titans, I guess, my most excited hire, and I just can't wait for them to get started. Well, like you said, um, last week we were, we were pretty bogged down with just a lot of new stuff going on. And like you mentioned, I did happen to start a new job. I actually started writing for the uh, the Herald here at WKU, the student paper. So I'm pretty excited about that. I think my first couple articles will be coming out in uh, this week's edition. So everybody be on the lookout for that, I guess. Give me some feedback and all that type of stuff. Um, I am, I'm, I'm pretty excited to let everybody read all my new work and stuff but as far as the titans go 
I'd say, since you already said LaFleur, I guess I'll go with our defensive coordinator, uh, Dean Pease. And, you know, I'm really, really excited about him for a lot of different reasons. But I think the number one reason is after Kevin Byard's like breakout season last year, Pro Bowl and everything else, lead the NFL in interceptions. I really think that obviously in the future, we're going to need to capitalize on him. And I think Coach Pease knows a lot about that because he had a few good safeties in Baltimore, uh, namely Ed Reed and um, Bernard Pollard and just a lot of other, you know, really, really good guys. And so. So Pollard was telling the Nashville media that, you know, he he thought that Bayard was really going to flourish in our new defense because, you know, our new coach and coordinator really have a kind of a defensive background and they're really going to be putting him on full display and letting him kind of show his talents to the rest of the league if they didn't already know after this year. Yeah, like you said, um, they're going to be – no, I don't really know how to say what I'm trying to say. They're going to really run things to our players' strengths, and I think that Coach Vrabel knows that, and that's absolutely huge for really the fan base and the and the players because last year at times you could see the players were really unsure of what they were doing, and it was just kind of ugly, and they weren't confident, but now that we have the right guys in there and we're going to start running the right things, I think we're We'll see a much improved Titans team. I definitely agree with you because I think that the big message with this new coaching staff, which is obviously spearheaded by Mike Vrabel, but all of these assistants are kind of echoing the same sentiment. And it's that we just want to maximize the talent. We want to tailor our offense, our defense, our coaching style, our whatever to the players that we have. And so I feel like for too many years, the Titans have been caught up in this kind of like when Wisenhunt came here and, you know, we bring in like Ray Horton and we had to overhaul our entire defense. Like we changed scheme, had to get all new players. And it's never been about maximizing the players that we already have. It's always about, well, we need this. We need that. We need to change this. Like don't change anything. Just utilize what you've already got to the best way that you can. And that's the key to being a successful uh, successful NFL coach. And something I forgot to mention, I have a little bit of an announcement myself. I will be leaving the podcast. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm not leaving the podcast. <laughs> but I did get an internship this summer with the Titans uh, for their grounds crew. So I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, it'll help me, you know, learn more about what NFL teams do when it comes to, like, taking care of their fields and whatnot. But anyways, um, a little bit more about this episode. It's going to be a lot different than anything we've done before drake do you want to tell them why well if you guys haven't already seen from the post and even the name of the episode depending on how you're watching this or listening to it we're actually going to have our very first guest on the podcast. We, we Obviously, we love Andrew. He is a special guest. He has a special place in our hearts. But we're talking outside, you know, someone uh, distinct coming onto the show and talking with us about, you know, just whatever the questions that we ask. So this interview that we're going to be playing for you guys today is it was conducted by me. Um, for a class assignment, and after I kind of got the messages that I needed for the class assignment, which is only like two to three minutes, I kind of went off and asked some more questions, some more general questions of uh, Coach Obi, who is a former NFL player. His name is, his full name is Terry Obi, and he's just one of the most interesting people that you'll ever meet. Very, very well-spoken guy. So much fun to talk to. Um, I had him in class last semester. He's just a fantastic dude, and so whenever we needed an assignment, um, it was for civil rights, you know, it's Black History Month, and we were trying to give out some stories about kind of diversity and civil rights and just hardships and things like that. So whenever that was the assignment and we had to talk to somebody, I immediately thought of Coach Obi, and he was gracious enough to grant me an interview and also grant me the permission to use it for our show, you know, the full entirety of this interview for the show. And, you know, we're, we're really excited about presenting this for you guys this week. Yeah, I'm excited, especially because Coach Obi, I, I, of course, I wasn't there to interview with Drake, but that's not what matters. What matters is he's a former NFL player. He knows the business, and, you know, that's pretty exciting for me. I've, I've been telling Drake I can't wait to listen to it. I haven't heard it yet. So when you guys hear it, it will probably be when I hear it. I'm just, like, if you guys, if you guys haven't learned by now, Drake literally does, like, if you look on our Twitter, he runs the Twitter. Uh, I mean, I tweet a few times in there uh, every once in a while. 
but Drake does all the dirty work. So I'm just, I'm just, I'm just talking. Really, I bring a little bit to the table, not as much as Drake, but I do know that he did an excellent job with this, and I'm just excited as he is, and I hope it's good. I really think it will be, and I'm excited for you guys to listen. Well, I uh, I definitely appreciate you saying that. You know, we both kind of bring our own special, unique things and skills and things like that to the podcast, you know, as far as coming up with ideas and segments and you know, just brainstorming all the time and just talking Titans 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so, you know, I definitely agree with you. I'm, I'm very excited for our listeners to, you know, this, is, this really is almost like a learning experience. Like there is a lot of really, really good discussion and I'm excited for you to hear it. And I'm excited for our listeners to hear it because I feel like the national media and ESPN and whatever kind of gets a bad rap for taking a kind of a biased stance on the type of discussion that, you know, that I had with Coach Obi. And so this is definitely a different perspective. It, it brings a lot of light on some things. And, you know, I think that's just about enough talking about it. We're, we're, I guess we need to just let you guys listen to it, huh? Yeah, I mean, what more can we do hyping it up? But, you know, it's definitely worth all the hype. It, it, it definitely is, and we're very excited, and we are very, very thankful and gracious to Coach Obi for granting us this interview. But with that being said, our very next segment is our first special guest, Mr. Terry Obi, former NFL wide receiver and college coach. Wait for the snap from center. Back, give it to on the option, go around. Terry Obi's going to score! Obi scores the touchdown! Obi scores the touchdown! Uh, Terry Obi, work at Western Kentucky University. I'm originally from uh, California, Northern California, Richmond, Oakland, California. And so what is a personal experience that you've had in your life, maybe of just some like prejudice or like a civil rights incident that's happened in, in your lifetime? You know, there was a, the, the biggest incident coming from uh, I, I grew up in, you know, the 70s and 80s and in, in Richmond, California. And uh, the thing is, and that's when they were start started shipping in uh, kids from different schools and everything and had a chance to uh, integration in the schools. And that, that was the big change coming from the inner city and into the suburbs and the, the big changes. But in California, it was more of a melting pot. Um, we didn't really have as much and see as much going on. But that was one incident. And then as as I got older, uh, going to the University of Oregon, there wasn't as many people of color at the University of Oregon uh, transition. But for some reason, when you're a football athlete, the transition is a little easier uh, for athletes. Did I ever feel racism? Uh, racism sometimes is is not in a place where we, we call racism, but sometimes when, when people forget about and don't really take in consideration your identity and backgrounds that make a difference because we didn't know where we went there to the University of Oregon. It was not a, a barbershop. That was a big thing. So it's all about inclusion. Just be sensitive to other people. Right, right. So where do you think we're at in the United States of America right now in like race relations as far as like what you see in your daily life? I think we're we were doing we're doing doing okay, but we're going pretty well for a while. But I think with this with the with the new president, I think it's starting to go back to a little you know the bad ways that we had before. I mean, the the thing is though, I mean, but most people would agree that you know we we all this together. And the big problem when you just start dividing people, that be that becomes a problem. But I think the race relations is, is starting to be because of social media and because of the new presidency. Things are things are starting to change, and people are starting to believe in in certain areas. But I, I really don't see uh, color like that. I, I just think my brother is somebody that you know that takes care of themselves, just like I would take care of my family. That's the most important. All right. And so you spoke about your family. So kind of, I guess, just talk about maybe uh, what you see maybe in the future for your kids, like if they've had any like first or anything in their field, or where you feel like all of them are going as far as the future, like we're talking about. You know what? I mean, because we, we face it every day. My my kids are, I mean, it's, it's my job to put them in the best situation. And, and, and that's the main thing. They interact with everybody. My son was one of the first out of Bowling Green, uh, the, the city of Bowling Green, to go to Little League World Series, especially African-American kid. And he was two time, you know, uh, all American for the Little League World Series. So that was a huge accomplishment. Uh, I even to, to my son, my, old, my son has just graduated from junior high. He goes to school in Nashville because that's the best school for him academically. And I think that changes when it, when the economic factor, 
a lot of people become racist, don't really understand when the, when 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 you're talking about money and economics, it makes a huge change. But education makes a difference. That a change in athletics makes a difference. That change a lot of things. But is it always fair? Um, I, I believe. I mean, the thing is, um, you treat people fairly, but not necessarily equal all the time because some people do things different. Some people work harder. Uh, some people have athletic attributes. Some have other people have God given talent. I treat people really fair, but I don't necessarily think it's it should be necessarily always equal. So in your coaching and your teaching experience, how how do you feel like that reflects there too? Maybe like maybe the positive impact that you try to have on people that you've coached or that you teach and all that kind of thing. And then that's why I got in uh, coaching for 15 years. The main thing is I I got into coaching to really to affect young men, young men and women. If I'm a coach. It makes a difference. I mean, as you talk about, you can make a people a difference in people's lives and their future. Just one kid at a time makes a difference. So it's the same thing with teaching. If I can affect one young person, then that'll 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 help everybody overall. It doesn't matter what color, creed. I have time for everybody because there's somebody that needs help in each area. I don't see color. I, I see the opportunity for that next person to be successful. And sometimes it's a lot of ignorance. Um, and I find out even in classes of. If, and then I'm okay with that. If 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 you don't, if that's all you understand, I'm I'm fine with that. I, I I would rather talk to them and explain to them if somebody don't really understand, because most of the time they don't. They just hear, "Oh, my parents did it that way." But is it necessarily right? You have to be able to stand on your own. Do you have like a specific story, maybe from maybe your like early years, like your childhood, or maybe even your college days at Oregon? where you kind of face a situation where you maybe had to like make a decision kind of like you're saying where maybe you were treated just a little bit unfair or maybe prejudiced against but maybe you had to make a tough decision our thing though it's it's gonna have a different perspective uh going to the university of oregon culturally it was way different i mean there was not a lot of things for african-american males to do there there was i mean like we said barber shop but i wasn't used to it there wasn't any there wasn't any inner city community there so really it was kind of like you almost was alienated because you wasn't just you wasn't familiar with everybody around there. I don't know if it was necessarily racism, but that's where racism starts. It has nothing to do with they don't no one likes you. It's it's just about not having the tools or not sensitive to somebody else's culture. That's that's really the biggest thing and that's what we miss it out. But I, I've learned though, but athletics though, we're able to transcend that though. So I have a more of a positive spin on it though. When you're in athletics, I think athletics is a culture in itself. Because uh, when you're in the locker room, no one cares if you're black, white, pink, or purple. Everybody's trying to win. You become a team. And if, if everybody had that sports and had the athletic background, I think our country would be a little different. Yeah, I was actually listening to an interview that it was actually Lil Wayne was on there with Shannon Sharp and Skip Bayless. And he said that he didn't even think racism existed anymore because he looks out in the crowd on his concerts and it's all white kids. So basically he was saying that racism to him like wasn't the same thing. But then Shannon Sharp said, you know, it's different when you are a famous person, kind of like when you are an athlete, you're up on a different kind of like pedestal. You know what I mean? Like it's a little bit different when you're maybe you have some respect. Exactly. And that, not necessarily just, a, you know, celebrity, but it's it, it's it's OK. And sometimes it, it, people justify it. And even with parents, oh, yeah, but they're entertainers, they're actors, they're coaches or they're players or athletes, but they're still people. But once we get past that and, and you just treat people like they are. But but on the, on the other side of that is that that's probably the only way they were able to see those people, too, though. I mean, how would you ever get opportunity to know somebody if you don't really spend time with them? But with athletes or musicians or whatever, you can at least hear their music. I mean, you can at least get to know them a little bit through their music and the, the, what they're listening to. And you can kind of transcend that. And that's why I thought athletics kind of helped me with, with that transition. But a lot of people paved the way be, before me. I mean, it wasn't always that way. I mean, just before that, University of Oregon didn't have a lot. When I went there, uh, that was just, you know, just starting to have more African-American males and I mean, people going to the school, even being able to go to school there. Yeah, would it have been a little different if I wasn't able to go to school there? Yeah, or if I wasn't able to go to certain colleges? Yeah, it would have been different, but I didn't experience that. So as far as like your NFL, like playing days and everything like that, did you ever experience anything? Or by that time kind of had it like, kind of like we're saying, you were already like that athlete, you were up on kind of like that pedestal where you didn't ever really face anything like that as far as in public or like you said, already in the locker room, you didn't really face that. No, like it's really, in, see in our locker room, that's why, I mean, athletics is just like you against the world, the team against the world. 
we had we got guys from Polynesian descent, uh, Japanese, Mexican, black, pink. It wasn't about that. You would whatever uniform you had, you was a Chicago Bear. And we even go back to reunion. We were Chicago Bear. Nobody looks at the color and all that. Other. I just think that's more of a mainstream and people trying to divide and conquer. And and I think it's just ignorance. And and what happens is when they get you to thinking that, I believe it's just conspiracy to sell you like if you're selling Pampers. If I can get this, you know, get these people undivided, I can maybe sell it to them at a cheaper price uh, or, or different. I mean, get them thinking on a different or sell them all that stuff. But they, it's just they're they're afraid. When you're afraid, you start listening, believing, and all that. But and then that's that's why I love to teach. Has been that I'm around students from everywhere. I mean, from all backgrounds, from the farms, from the country, from the inner cities, and they get a chance to say, "Man, you know what? That's a from a different perspective." Even if they had a race a bone in them, they're like, "Man, wow, he was in class with me. Man, he he wasn't like that." And I get to know them. Maybe that'll change the way they think. And I remember one of the stories that you had from uh, in class, it was something like kind of like when you go back home and you see some of like your old friends and they would kind of be doing like the same old thing, like that you had moved forward and that you kind of weren't on the same wavelength with them anymore because they were kind of stuck in the past. Like you speak on that a little bit. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the main thing with that is that. Uh, they, oh man, you my brother. Hold with my brothers don't hang out in the corner, man. You almost you forty something years old. I have a family. I don't hang out with a lot of guys and just hang out. I got a responsibility with my kids and family, so it has nothing to do with it. Man, your kids don't live in the inner city. No, no, that's where I came from. My kids are not going to be subject to drive by mugs. You know, we live in the suburbs. So when you can do better, you do better. That has nothing to do with racism. That has nothing to do with going back away from that. When you can do better, you do better for your family. And, and that's that's the main thing. There's no way I'm I'm hanging around with guys all day. I mean, I have I got things to do. I have kids to raise. I mean, so you're not my brother if you if you're doing that off. You're lazy. You're not working. We're not on the same accord. I don't care what color you are. Have you ever faced anything like getting in front of a group of professionals and like have you just ever faced like have you ever looked out and just feel like people were looking at you a different way just because of your background and who you are? You know what? I I, I guess I guess it's just more confidence and. And I feel like just the, the inner confidence, and I think I just I'm just blessed to to have that, and God has given me that ability just to have a I don't I don't I don't I don't perceive people that way. I I look at it as a platform to to reach others, but my idea is to to be who I I need to be, and and not and not not go around and, and worry about what other people think because that's just a waste of time. When you get a certain age, I mean, I, I really don't care about if people think about me negative and their opinion because I, I mean I can't control that anyway. So just talking a little bit about like your, uh, I know you did that thing over the summer one time with the Titans. And so just, it may be just a little bit about your experience doing that. Like, was it a, like, what kind of experience did that bring to your, to your like career and how you coach and teach going forward? Yeah, exactly. So I've, t I've taught down at the Titans and professionally for, uh, for a long period of time and got a chance to coach in college. And, and, and that's what kind of gets you, like we were talking about civil rights and everything. I've seen different kids from different walks of life. I've seen very rich, uh, rich uh, white, white kids or black, very rich, and then very poor black, very poor white. So I understand that it's not a, I mean, you can't have a, a set stone on anybody. There's some kids in the NFL that, that's, that came from Western Kentucky that were very, had a very poor upbringing, white and black, but they were successful in the NFL. I don't, and, and it's, it's funny, it's, I think it's all about economics. I don't think it's about color because there's people that, that are stressed out in a bad situation before, but even I get a chance to see players, even with the Titans and all those experiences in the in in NFL, Chicago Bears and all that. The bottom line is when you're around athletes, man, and that's the thing is we can cross tr transcend because when you're on the football field, man, you're trying to protect yourself, man. You got people trying to knock you out. Uh, so you're not worrying about if they like me or not. No one likes you. So that's how we face it. We we're trying to win. And that's the whole thing about win. It's about the team. It's not about the color and how people look. It's about the team. Yeah, I definitely understand. I know that even just in my high school, like I didn't worry about what color somebody was. Like no. it don't matter to me. Like yeah. it didn't matter what like like you said, where they come from, if they're poor, if they're rich or if they're black, white, Mexican, whatever. Like that just never even like crossed my mind whenever I was playing with guys in high school. Exactly. But the, but the more education, the better understanding, you know, a little bit more. So you can easily influence the majority of people that are racist. Don't really, they, they've been influenced by others. They're not really well educated, not educated, educated to the point to where they think on their own and they read. You start telling people and they believe it. And then they just become this person. Why you don't like that person? That doesn't make sense. I mean, you don't even know the person. That doesn't make a lot of sense at all. You're just wasting time. And it also, too, 
to me made me think about it. I think uh, biblically speaking and, and talk and it's when you don't like someone, that person doesn't know. It doesn't affect them, but it affects you because you don't want to have the ulcers and all the anxiety. I mean, so it's, it's a waste of time. The, the hate, the people that hate are the one who have the problem because they're dealing with the physical and the mental things. The, the people they hate on don't even know what's going on. Yeah, exactly. People that love, like you, feels good about yourself. Exactly. You, know you don't. I mean? You don't care about. I mean, you don't care about. I, I don't have. I don't have time for it because I, I don't like to make preconceived notions about anybody. I just let their actions show. Now, if if I see you doing a certain way, hey, if you're not going to school, you're not taking care of your family, you don't work, and or you're a bum. I mean, that, that's that's just how, I mean, I see it. But now if you're doing all the things, if you're doing what I'm doing, then, OK, you, we're brothers. But other than that, I mean, you're not brothers because of my color. You, you're the brothers because of we all on one accord and we, we live in the suburbs. We take care of our families and we do the best thing we can. We're good people, not because of we or your color or where you're from and all that. Yeah. So how do you feel about people that kind of are like that? Like it is white, black, anybody like they almost band together just based on what color they are. Like it's not even about like an actual camaraderie between them. It's just because they're the same color. that It's like they have to band together and like go against the world, like against other races, even like how do you feel about that? I, I, I think that's, that's so shallow because everybody is different. It has nothing to do with color. I mean, I don't judge. I mean, I don't make judgments like that. I, I make judgments based on my friendship and that person that I know individually. You have to really be careful because there's there's black, white, pink, bad, or good people in all races. So I mean, I don't make I don't make I don't make that assumption at all. I just judge people for who they are when they how they treat me. Yeah, that's what I've always been taught. That's what my parents taught me. It's like if someone treats you good, then that's someone that's your friend. That's someone to be nice to. But like yeah. if they don't treat you right, then I mean that's not, that don't mean you have to be racist to them or be mean to them. I mean, exactly. Just, just don't associate them. Ex exactly. Don't associate me because there's good and bad in everything. It has nothing to do with color. If you if you just look around, I mean, if that person's white, then I want to hang out with them. But you just miss an opportunity to have a great friend. I just, I just think that's just that's that's what I'm saying. Is it's it's worse for the people that are racist. Because you miss out on an opportunity to meet some nice people and you can band together with some some uh, some nuts that believe like you and don't really have your best interest at heart. And I noticed that you were born just within a couple months of Martin Luther King being assassinated. Mm -hmm. So, like, what kind of impact do you think that Dr. King and other kind of like figures like that have had on your life personally? Like, have you read a lot of his stuff or like, are you personally inspired by him? Like, what kind of role does him and other icons like that have in your life? Man, a great question. I mean, unbelievable. I mean, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King was the best order, best example. But, you know, he preached love for everybody. And he just wasn't, I don't see him just as, just as a, just as a black person, but just as a, a leader for everybody. And it paved the way. I mean, I wouldn't be able to teach. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be able to go to university. Those opportunities, if they would have to pay the way, a lot of my forefathers was able to go out there and, and fight and, and the people. And then, did you know the majority of people that fought were, were people that there were whites and blacks and they were banded together. It had nothing to do with just black people or pink, purple, uh, whatever. They banded together and some of them were part of the civil rights. There was a lot of whites that got beat up because of that. Put to jail, was on the front line. So you can't judge. I mean, even even back to slavery, there was there were still abolitionists that was trying to help the slaves to get free. And there's a lot of miscommunication that we don't understand. Even back in Africa, uh, if you look at history, a lot of it, it was a, it was about trade, it was about finance. Uh and it, in the in the jungle, some of the Africans then sold Africans to whites. So it, it was an economic thing. So it had nothing to do. So if we just looked at color, we'll be blind on seeing what the true, really true reason it is. But then you got people in, in all over both sides. You got racist black, uh, whites, Indian, whatever, uh, nationalities. And it doesn't make sense. I mean, because you're wasting time because you don't know who is who. Some people could be hiding behind a color and they're not really great people. So speaking of great people, who are some of the best like uh, young people that you've coached or even had in your classes that maybe there are like some name type people, you know what I mean? Like guys that you've coached that are playing in the league now, like who are some of the most like stand up guys, like guys that you really enjoy coaching? And stuff yeah, like yeah. Uh, whatever. S Seattle Seahawks, Doug Baldwin. He was at, I coached him at Stanford, really good kid, worked hard. Uh, Richard Sherman was one of those kids. He always going to speak up that kid. 
Jack Doyle from Bowling Green. He went to Western Kentucky University. There's there's just a numerous amounts of guys uh, that that was really just really been impactful. For then there was some people that was impactful for my life. Eugene Robinson played for the Carolina Panthers, and he was at Seattle when I was there. Huge influence for me. Uh, Anthony Carter, Chris Carter, all these guys were uh, Steve Largent. Uh, was one of the best receivers that ever taught me the game. He never worried about being a color or whatever. He just taught me how to play. Um, so there's just been a lot. There's been a lot of kids that I've uh, that I've coached, Anthony Wales, and uh, a lot of a lot of kids that are currently playing uh, in the NFL. I definitely heard like that you coach like Sherman and some of those guys. Like yeah. I really respect him. Like he's yeah. just a really like he's stand up guy. He's funny, man. He's but he's he doesn't lie. He doesn't take anything from people. No, and yeah. see, like even when they're playing, like you know, I'm a big Titans fan, you know, and like the whole thing, like when he had the hit this season on like Mariota on the sideline, mm-hmm. I'm like, I didn't even think it was dirty or anything. Like it was, they kind of like got into it or whatever. But like after the game, you see that he's such a man of character because. He came up to him. He apologized. He said, you know what, man? Like, I didn't mean to come at you like that. Like, that's not the way I am. Yeah. And then he was kind of talking to an offensive lineman, Taylor Lewan, and They were they were just kind of like chumming it up. And yeah. that just showed me right there, like, that's a stand-up guy for one thing. And kind of like you're saying in the NFL, like, they just don't see color. They got like a Hawaiian guy, a white offensive lineman, and then a black mm-hmm. corner. And like, it, it's no one cares. Yeah, it's no one cares. No, we're trying to win, man. You can't, you can't worry about that. You're trying to win games because I – if we're gonna do, if we're gonna divide ourselves, we'll lose. You know, we can't. Yeah. And that's we're kind of wrapping it up. Is there anything else that you want to like add or put out there? You know, maybe like a summary statement or just anything that that I haven't asked you about that you kind of want to put out there. You no, know, I think you did a really good job and, and continue to do well. And I, and I I think your future is very bright. And uh, and to, to me, even with civil rights, this this is an opportunity to that you came that you've even felt comfortable even talking to me about this, but that's, that's the thing is to just keep the pace, keep the same mindset, judge people. Don't, don't really judge them. Uh, it's, 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 you, you can, you can determine how people are great people by what they do, but not how they look or their, uh, I mean, their, their skin tone or their races and all that stuff. Don't, don't get involved in that. Just be stay, stay focused, get education, surround yourself with great people. Well, I thank you. I thank you for saying all that. Okay. Wow. I'm, I'm blown away, man. Like with everything that was just said, I think I'd want him on the Titans staff. I really do. Dude sounds like he knows more than I could ever imagine thinking about when it comes to talking football and, you know, just, I mean, you know him better than I do. So do you think he'd be a good addition to the staff? I think he'd be a great addition to any staff, any classroom, any type of, Anything where you need to deal with people and all different kinds of people, because like he mentioned in the interview, you know, he has experience dealing with people from all different backgrounds and, you know, guys. He's dealt with NFL players, future NFL players, you know, um, just guys that were great in college. And then also in all his classes now, he's dealt with people from all different types of backgrounds and nationalities and everything. So I don't really know of a better communicator with all different types of people, which is exactly what you need when you're trying to, you know, coach up a group of guys in a locker room. Yeah. So uh, is there anything else Titans related that you wanted to speak upon? Well, one interesting little nugget was, um, you know, kind of some guys off Malarkey staff getting hired and getting new jobs and whatever. And something that happened today on Valentine's Day was pretty interesting to me was Terry Robisky getting a new job, but uh, I don't think it was as a coordinator. It was as a wide receivers coach. <laughs> he had his chance. <laughs> he had his chance. And the, the thing that really kind of sticks out to me and is just kind of funny in hindsight Around the time we were talking about firing Malarkey, before we actually did it, Deion Sanders said that he would think that Terry Robisky would be getting head coaching looks. Can you believe that? I cannot. That is honestly one of the dumbest things I think I've ever heard. Like, I don't know what his reasoning or why he thought that, or I'm not exactly sure what his reasoning or rationale was, but... And, you know, the funny thing to me, too, is... Just uh, malarkey assistants that are currently out of the NFL right now. His special team coach, 
his running back coach, his linebacker coach, his D-line coach, his assistant D-line coach, and a defensive assistant. And then Dick LeBeau and Russ Graham are both retiring. <laughs> hey, it's like those tweets where it's like you – it's like the upgrade button. It's like yeah, Malarkey and then Vrabel. <laughs> I'm serious. Like people were so up in arms like when we fired Malarkey – and then it's kind of like now his staff is all out there. Like if if he was such a great coach, why did not why did he not get a new job? And if he had such great coaching staff, why are you know two or three of his best assistants struggling to get jobs? Like that should be the most telling thing to anyone, even someone that has nothing to do with the Titans. Like just an you know an objective observer. That should tell them right there, like, wow, that maybe that wasn't such a good staff. Maybe they overperformed a little bit. Another thing that I just remembered that the Feels Like 99 Twitter tweeted about today, I don't remember who the tweet came from, but it ranked the seven coaching hires. He finished, Before he ranks them, he says, let the debate begin. With number one, of course, he has John Gruden, who, depending on who you ask, I think he's a failed NFL coach. There's a reason he hadn't, he hadn't coached in 10 years. He's got him ranked as number one. He thinks Frank Reich, I don't even know how to say his name, the Colts guy they just hired after they got whatever you want to call it by Josh McDaniels, they really think he's better. They really think that Coach Vrabel is the worst hire. He says he likes Vrabel. He says he loves Matt LaFleur to be the offensive coordinator. But come on, man. You really think that Pat Shermer is a better coach? There's plenty of guys on here that the Titans didn't even interview. Come on. I'm so tired of the Titans not getting the national attention they deserve, or let alone the respect. Drake, do you have any last thoughts that aren't as angering as mine? Well, I guess I'll say that I totally agree with you. I think it's it's laughable that Mike Vrabel would be the worst coaching hire. And the worst part is that he tries to justify ranking him last by saying, oh, I like him, I like his hires, I like this. Well, if you liked him that much, then he wouldn't be the worst coaching hire. So clearly there's some type of bias there. There's some type of... I don't even know what to call it. Just blatant disrespect is what it is. That's what the Titans always face. I don't know what it comes from, but I'll just leave our listeners with this. And it's one of those classic things I heard at all Super Bowl season, especially once um, Peterson actually won the Eagles their Super Bowl. He was ranked the worst coaching hire in the NFL in the offseason by ESPN the season that he got hired. So we'll we'll just drop the mic on that. (laughs) Yeah, so... uh... I guess if that's all we have. Yeah. Um, I guess that's I guess that really is just about everything. You you're good. You don't have anything else? I think we're good. All right. You've been listening to the Feels Like 99 podcast with Drake Kaiser and Caleb Waters. You can find the podcast on Twitter at Feels Like 99 Pod. Uh you can find the Feels Like 99 podcast on our new website, feelslike99.wordpress.com. And you can find just about everything you need, need there. You can find the archives of the Feels Like 99 podcast on YouTube. If you search Feels Like 99 podcast, you can subscribe by hitting the subscribe button. You can find my co-host, Drake Kaiser, on Twitter at DrakeKaiser underscore. You can find myself on Twitter at CalebWaters underscore 14. Tell a friend about the Feels Like 99 podcast. Could be a friend, girlfriend, boyfriend, Titans fan, Jags fan. Could be any of them, you know. We talk about more than just the Titans. We talk about it all on the Feels Like 99 podcast. It's a podcast for everybody, guys. Uh, so, signing off uh, for myself and my co host, Drake Kaiser. This is Caleb. Thanks, ugly guy. Thanks, ugly guy. You there? Yeah. 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 What just happened?